Padiushi, Nanaka Vinisana Cavadowini, Gilberto Cartas Posada, Ne Lilia Guzmán Cartas, Ne Vineliche Cartas Arias de Rancho Gubinia, Nalaya Joshua Schwab Cartas, Oraque Esquiche Pelatu, Ne Vini Sumas, Ne Vini Masquium, Ne Vini uh, Hawaiian, Ne Cabini Conferencia. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Joshua Schwab Cartas. I just introduced myself, who my family is in our community and our language of Dijasa, also known as Isma Saptak, uh, language I'm currently learning. Um, I am a member of the Isma Saptak nation on my mother's side. Um, that is one of 16 indigenous nations in the southern Mexican state of Oaxaca. I also want to acknowledge today that I am on the shared and traditional ancestral territory of the Sumas First Nations and the Matsqui First Nations here in Abbotsford, British Columbia. I would also like to thank our hosts, the Native Hawaiians, for allowing us to present on their territory, I'll bet it virtually, but I'd also like to thank everybody who was involved in organizing this amazing conference and bringing us together to share our work to help revitalize and document indigenous languages around the world. In the next 20 minutes, I will do the best to explain my doctoral research project, which in many ways is been the culmination of 17 years of ongoing language revitalization work in our community. My project examines how mobile technology, specifically cell films, that is short videos made with cell phone videos or mobile devices can facilitate in this case, Zapotec language revitalization, foster intergenerational dialogue, as well as provide a medium of documentation for future generations. So my talk today is entitled, Learning to Live Our Zapotec Language, Zapotec Elders and Youth Fostering Intergenerational Dialogue Through Cell Phone. Our community of Rancho Luvinia, located in the Southern Mexican state of Oaxaca, like many other indigenous communities around the globe, is fighting and struggling to preserve its ancestral language of Dijesa. In fact, according to the Mexican National Institute of Statistics and Geography 2015 census, our community of 15,347 inhabitants had less than 7,500 speakers, which is alarming considering my grandfather and many other elders in my community told me that less than 40 years ago, virtually our entire community spoke our language. That is a little over one generation, only 56% of our community speaks our language with the majority of them being over 60. I'm saddened to think that the words I vocalized in our language of Dijesa could fall silent within my daughter's lifetime. The question is, is how do we address this crisis? Well, it's typically done through a process of language revitalization. In fact, within our community, Binikubi, a local media collective, which I am a member of, has for the last 19 years explored and created various initiatives aimed specifically at youth to revitalize our language and celebrate our culture. And some of these strategies have included Zapotec classes, recording our elders, recording local musicians, and creating CDs of our language with bilingual inserts, games such as Loteria, and documentary films, to name a few approaches we have tried over the last 19 years. I would be remiss if I did not talk about this project without speaking in part about my positionality as a biracial Zapotec insider, outsider, ally, and my very personal motivation and journey behind this project. When I first entered my grandfather's community of Union Hidalgo 17 years ago, I understood that the acceptance into our community would not come overnight. Despite sharing a common ancestry and having a strong foundation of our customs and our protocols, thanks to my grandparents, I therefore entered our community as an outsider, but with an ally mentality, and as a Zapotec person wanting to learn more about their language and culture, and as an Indigenous person ultimately wanting to decolonize themselves. I understood that this was going to be a lifelong process and a commitment that was rooted in direct and dedicated community action which for me has meant being a member of the Binikubi for the last 17 years, learning from them and working alongside them on various projects that promote and celebrate our Zapotec culture and identity. This journey has required patience, humility, and ongoing critical self-reflection to unlearn my various privileges and assumptions, 
but also accepting the fact that I might never be truly or fully culturally competent. I undertook this lifelong journey of learning our language and reconnecting with my Binisa culture, not for the pursuit of critical and cultural consciousness or to become a better researcher. Rather, the goal has always been to be able to ensure that I could learn my ancestral culture and language so one day I would be able to transmit the knowledge of my ancestors to my daughter and ultimately feel and become more Zaptec. So the research question I had for my doctoral project was the following. How can mobile technologies such as cell phones or iPods and tablets combined with a participatory cell film approach in the context of intergenerational and experiential learning play a role in the revitalization and maintenance of indigenous languages and knowledge? Now I wanted to share just a brief history of the methodology. In fact, the methodology used for this research project is actually the continuation and further development of a language revitalization initiative that started in 2009 through a collaboration between our media collective, Bini Kubi and Modesta Vicente, an elder who's pictured here in the middle, uh, who has unfortunately since passed. Now Modesta, as she was better known in our community, approached our media collective to produce a short doc documentary film about her Geta Visa making process. She wanted to safeguard her recipe for future generations. She said she wanted to leave it to the younger kids in our, in our community. The process with Namodesta combined video documentation and an embodied learning approach to learning our language and ancestral practices. What I mean by that is that she invited us to participate in all aspects of her black bean making process, black bean tamal making process. That is that throughout the entire process of filming Namodesta preparing black bean tamal, she insisted we learn the names of all the ingredients in all the process. For example, she would get us to repeat several words in our language, visa, bean, guinea, chili, vita, epazote, sa, lard, vacuela, corn husk. That besides getting us to try and commit these terms to memory, she invited every single member of our collective to actually get our hands dirty, so to speak, and literally, because she actually got us to engage in actually making the process, putting our hands in the masa and feeling the heat of the wood burning stove when we were inserting the, the tamales into the suki. But by putting a practice like black bean tamales at the center of language learning, instead of grammar or isolating our language learning to a classroom setting, it not only provided us with an accessible entry point into our language for speakers at any language level proficiency, but more importantly, it grounded her teachings and our language in a Zapotec worldview and epistemology. By engaging in this process of experiential learning, which has been at the heart of cultural continuity for millennia, not only did we continue to perpetuate our culture, but it enriched our understanding about what it means to embody and enact our Zaptec ways of being in the world. It also helped us understand important terms such as Gendalisa, Tequio, and Comunalidad, while also learning our language and other community traditions. But for years after this encounter, I asked myself the following question. How could I take these teachings from this encounter, which combined experiential learning and Zapotec pedagogy with technology, and make it a possibly enduring community approach to language learning and revitalization and documentation? Unfortunately, our collective, like most of our community at the time, lacked access to audiovisual technology and knowledge of editing software. Therefore, it was a very unsustainable approach. It was not until I met my mentor and supervisor, Dr. Claudia Mitchell, that this embodied cell film method became a viable and feasible approach in our community. While discussing our lack of available audiovisual technology in our community, Claudia asked me if I'd ever used a cell phone to make a video and whether that could be an option in our community. It was then that she introduced me to a participatory visual method known as cell filming. And for those of us that are not familiar with cell filming, a very basic description of a cell film is a short 
video shot on a cell phone of varying lengths and production value that can be easily disseminated via phones or social media made by the everyday citizen. So my study therefore is rooted in two distinct but complementary methodologies, which both include principles of co-learning, experiential methods, shared knowledge practices, respectful relationships, but more importantly, they're both dedicated and committed to social action in everyday life. Comunalidad describes a way of living that has been around for centuries, rooting this project in our community while honoring and reflecting its values. It is embodied in teachings and practices such as na modestas. So to bridge these ancestral teachings and philosophies in a way that is relevant to digitally literate youth while tapping into their already media making skills, Comunalidad was merged with a participatory cell film approach through a series of intergenerational cell filmmaking workshops. And within these workshops, we paired elders with youth while engaging them both in video documentation while simultaneously learning Zaptec language within a lived context, such as making tamales or extracting sand or shadowing an elder uh, who works at the market, thus exposing and fully immersing them into an everyday ancestral uh, Zaptec practice. And this was done as a means to bridge that gap between elder and youth, but also to nurture youth's relationship with their language and culture in hopes of restoring their connection to their Zaptec way of life. So the overall goals and objectives of the project were the following. Number one, to connect youth with elders through participatory self-filmmaking workshops. Two, to promote the importance and values and continuity of ancestral practices across generations. To employ local on-hand resources like cell phone cameras in order to make the workshop sustainable on an ongoing basis within the community. And lastly, to facilitate the development of a pilot model for language learning that brings elders and youth together through a focus on Zaptec ancestral practices. Here I wanted to just give a brief overview of the project, which uh, was carried out over three parts over a two-year period between 2014 and 2016. Uh, the first portion of the project started actually, in fact, in Canada, um, and this was the pre-research consultation. And this process was to ensure that the objectives and goals and protocols were being discussed amongst the collective and other members of the community. But we are also trying to figure out the parameters and goals of the workshop as well as discussing the feasibility of a, of a cell film workshop. That is, whether or not there was enough mobile devices in our community to make this a sustainable approach. The second uh, step was actually in the community itself, and that's where we began the promoting the, the workshops themselves and then finding elders who would participate and be willing to work with youth for an extended period of two months. And finally, the last section or portion of this project was the actual the screening and reflection period. That's where we screened the cell films made for friends and family and eventually for the community at large, while also engaging in assembleas or talking circles to reflect on the process of cell filming and the entire experience of working with elders. So in terms of uh, research participants, uh, since we were trying to bridge that gap between elders and youth and really fostering that intergenerational connection, we had a very broad spectrum of ages participating in the workshops. Uh, I think our youngest participant was 13 years old and our oldest participant was, I believe, 86 years old. Um, and so the majority of participants who attended our workshop were from Unión Hidalgo and we made it uh, specifically that way. We didn't want to open it up to the larger community of Juchitan or Tehuantepec. We really wanted to kind of keep it local and focused on our community, but we did open it up to a smaller neighboring community that's about 15 minutes away from Unión uh, called Chicapa de Castro, which is also a Zaptec speaking community. Um, so it was quite exciting. I think the the opening weekend uh, of our workshop, we had around 35, 37 participants, uh, mostly young women. Um, however, that number of participants diminished very quickly. And the reason for that is because our community was devastated by a chinconcuya epidemic. So, I mean, our entire community um, just was 
just fell ill under that, including my co-PI and myself. Um, so the very end, our workshop finished off with a total of nine participants. Um, so the workshop itself was over a two month period, we would meet up two to three times a week. Each session varied. It could, uh, depending on what topic we were addressing, it could go from one to two hours, sometimes three to four hours, depending on the topic that we were looking into. And, and, and of course, people's energy levels. Um, so participants in these workshops were kind of asked to reflect on language loss in their own lives. How has it affected them? Thinking about places in our community that they still see language as very vibrant and, and then kind of comparing it to spaces that language is perhaps not as strong and not as vibrant. Um, we also taught them how to make their own cell phone, which required a lot of steps, right? Thinking about brainstorming, how to develop a proper prompt, uh, best lighting and filming practices. Um, and so, yeah, and uh, in the end of the, the workshop, uh, I think we ended up with two uh, full cell films. One was made by Sikaru Torres, uh, entitled Shkenda. And Shkenda looked at uh, funerary practices in our community. And the second one, actually here, if I draw your attention, I'm actually circling it here. That's actually the second one that was made, which followed an elder by the name of Lionel Ruiz, Ruiz who extracts sand to build houses in our community. And this was actually made by two young participants here, Edward and uh, Amelia, and my co-PI, Jose, here, and myself. So now I wanted to share with you all uh, just an example of a cell film that was made in our community. It was actually made by Giovanni de Jesus Rodriguez Casola, who was actually at the time the youngest, not the youngest, but one of the youngest participants who in our cell film making workshop. And uh, the following cell film is actually kind of an overview of at least four or five different cell films he made and he kind of stitched them together. Um, just to kind of kind of a trailer of all the work that he's made. And I just wanted to note that Giovanni's entry that we're going to watch was actually the second place winner at the International McGill Cell Film Festival. So please enjoy. Gracias, de la de de so the following section I entitled Coming to Knowledge, it's essentially my findings, and I describe this personal and collective process and journey of our group coming to knowledge, restoring our relationship and our interconnection with the land, each other, language, culture, and identity. The project is grounded in an indigenous Zapotec epistemology, which really emphasizes um, a kind of a non-fragmented holistic nature of understanding the world, where there is no separation between language and governance, uh, philosophy and ancestral practices. And then again, that is why I present the knowledge learned in an interconnected wheel, instead of isolating these knowledges into separate findings. The project created an encounter that allowed elders and youth to come together, exposing youth to an immersive language situation where they could engage and observe ancestral practices that they're not typically exposed to, therefore successfully bridging this generational gap that has hindered the younger generation's ability to connect with elders, teachings, and community knowledge. But a key to this gap was the mobile technology not because there's something inherently transformative in uh, technology itself, but because it creates a more reciprocal exchange between elder and youth. 
What I mean is that there is an understanding that elders are knowledge holders and language keepers, but that youth themselves are also a type of knowledge holders in the form of technology, which can and does play an important role in not only creating resources, but also documenting our language and, and social practices for future generations. Therefore, they can feel like they're taking up that mantle of perpetuating our culture and language to the next generation. Also through this project, we were also able to dispel misconceptions of youth just wasting time on these mobile devices in light of learning their language and culture. In fact, through this process of these workshops, we learned that youth not only saw technology as a vital part of their identity, but as a real possibility to not only learn their language, but also as a way to preserve and transmit their, their ancestral knowledge. Um, what was particularly interesting that came out of these workshops was that they were in fact you almost unanimously all the participants in our workshop said that they were very much interested in wanting to learn their language and, and ancestral practices the problem laid in the fact that elders and parents weren't actually teaching them so um that was an important discovery for or finding that came out of this workshop um but i'm also particularly interested in highlighting the fact that through these encounters grounded in our our traditional epistemologies, youth came to understand and feel how language is connected not only to histories, but to identity and place and expressed through ancestral practices such as making tamales or extracting sand or other embodied activities. And they're reaffirmed through speaking it and sustained through repetition. By immersing them in a worldview that in emphasizes this interconnectedness of everything, youth learned that language is only one aspect of restoring fully restoring their relationship with their Zapotec culture, identity, and worldview, which is why they came to understand that language and teaching must always be grounded in context alongside elders or other knowledge holders. Upon reflecting on the overall project, participants, Jose and myself, we felt that this self-film approach really struck the right balance between uh, technology and language and cultural learning, uh, because on the one hand, it's already tapping into use uh, pre-existing media making skills, and yet it's refocusing it on Zapotec language and culture within our community. Um, and it does so in such a way that makes it relevant and appealing to youth, but it continues to still honor our ancestral life ways. Also, the emphasis on intergenerational bonding ensured that cell films or cell phones, may I say, and mobile devices were uh, uh, seen as tools uh, that can act as catalysts to action and even documentation for future generations, but not a replacement for elders. Um, despite this being an exploratory project, it continues to yield very promising results. Uh, for example, Giovanni Carsola continued to make cell films long after the cell film workshop was over, which gained them critical acclaim. And his uh, videos alone have garnered over 50,000 views on YouTube. And I just recently found out that uh, another one of our participants went on to uh, create his own Zaptech media collective that broadcasts Zaptech only content from his community of Chicapa de Castro, which really suggests that people are very interested in celebrating and revitalizing their language and culture within our communities. Uh, I wanted to end this by just acknowledging and thanking all the research participants who participated in this project, who left me with so much hope. Um, of course, now we'll uh, Modesta Vicento and Na Modesta, who is the entire inspiration for this project and methodology, uh, Jose Arenas Lopez and the members of the Vinicubi, uh, my supervisors, uh, Dr. Claudia Mitchell and Dr. Mela Sarkar, and of course the Participatory Cultures Lab in McGill. Uh, this research would have also not been made possible without the generous uh, funding of the research du Quebec and the international development research here in Canada. And I'd also lastly like to thank the International Conference on Language Documentation and Conservation for bringing all these knowledge holders and scholars together uh, for this conference. Thank you so much and I look forward to your questions.